whether you have been a part of the church for decades or have never set foot in this place, unless you've been living under a rock or purposefully steering clear of any and all media and family dinners, you've heard plenty of opinions and controversy about the place of politics in our faith, our family, and in the church. Despite the presumption in my family of origin that all would simply sign on to my daddy's proudly proclaimed political perspectives, the old maxim of avoiding the topic of religion and politics at the dinner table held pretty steady at our house, especially when there was a difference of opinion. Anybody else have that rule in their house? Let me see the, the, uh, the wisdom uh, is pretty pervasive in our society. We can probably all sympathize with this instinct given how intense incivility and our political divide has become. No one wants to invite the overreaching ravages of the public square into our family relationships. Maybe you've had your own battles over hot topics at the table. Maybe you felt like you had to block some radical relatives or fallacious friends on Facebook just to stay centered and sane. Maybe there have been family members disinvited from Thanksgiving on account of political views. Maybe friendly conversation over the fence has subsided in the past few election cycles. Maybe it is better to ban these topics altogether, leave Pandora's, uh, Pandora's box closed and on the shelf, if you will. And yet, we ought not lose sight of what is lost when we stop conversation. Whether it's about abortion, the economy, the environment, or systemic racism, because the data demonstrates that being in the discussion about sensitive topics does change things. It is imperative, if you will, that we stay in the discussion. In an age increasingly marked by incivility, we need places where we can learn or relearn the practice of civil disagreement. That is, the art of disputing others' ideas in ways that respect those persons' intrinsic worth. One of the books that has most inspired my personal engagement and my sense of call as a Christian to civic engagement is the Quaker educator Parker Palmer's Healing the Heart of Democracy, the courage to create a politics worthy of the human heart. Any of you who've been around me for a while have heard me reference this before. In it, excuse me, in it, Parker takes on our current political climate with its atrophy of citizen participation, the ascendance of an oligarchy that shapes politics, and the substitution of vituperation for thoughtful public discussion. He wrestles with essential questions of public life and suggests that the wrestling with difference is therapeutic for us as citizens and for the American body politic. His insights are heart deep and grounded in the understanding that America can gain a politics worthy of our humanity by living with tension and difference. We can help reclaim public life by actions as simple as walking down the street instead of driving so that we can engage our neighbor. Hope in and for our democracy is hardly cheap, but history is made up of what Palmer calls a million invisible acts of courage and the incremental gains that came with them. He urges us to keep on walking, keep on talking, just as we did in the civil rights movement, until we find the places to engage, cross those bridges together and heal democracy. So if not us, who? If not now, when, in the words of the old Sweet Honey in the Rock hymn, we are the ones that we have been waiting for. So the family dinner table and the church family formation circle gives us a place to do just that healing. And they're uniquely suited to serve as a training ground where we can cultivate the virtue of civility. 
That's not to say that we should abandon all discretion and throw ourselves into the relational equivalent of a head-on collision. I'm not suggesting that we abandon good judgment or allow others free reign to abuse or control the conversation, spill out harmful diatribe, conspiracy theories, or racist rhetoric. Rather, it is to say that because of the natural affection amongst us and the natural desire to honor the worth of all of us, the family and the faith community are great places to lay the groundwork for civility. Over the long haul, because we need each other and because we want to hold on to each other, the family and the faith community are great places to talk about politics because we're motivated to develop the skills and capacity for dialogue, discussion, and discernment, because we're motivated to be able to stay in relationships despite our differences, and we're motivated to listen to each other and look for other ways to see things. Parker explains that it is in the tension between ideas and the civil engagement with these differences that new ways of seeing things unfold. How democratic is that? Finding a third way. So let's turn specifically then to the question of politics in the church. Some say that politics has no place in the pulpit, and certainly it is not the church's place to advise on or encourage the choice of a party position or a specific politician. That would be partisan politics, and it is not the church's place to be there despite what you hear over in other settings. We don't do partisan politics here. Others say that the church has no place in politics. Well, I'm here to tell you that in the past eight years of our sanctuary story of outward facing civic engagement and moral leadership, there have been plenty in our own city who have let it be known that they do not appreciate finding the church in the city square. Usually, they disagree with our progressive perspective on matters of justice and equity. Sometimes, it's because they've been harmed by the church or have, br have brought into, the perspect uh, into it the perspective that the church does more harm than good. And they just do not want the church to even be in their viewfinder. Needless to say, public opinion on the place of the church in politics is as conflicted as the questions of politics in the pulpit and as convoluted as the matter of religion and politics at grandmom's table. And yet, our siblings in faith have always been about the church working for justice. Congregationalists left England for religious freedom. They dumped tea into the Boston Harbor in political protest of taxation without representation. They opposed slavery as early as 1770. They helped to, to lead abolition and argued for the release of the Amistad captives. They created the open and affirming movement for the, for the, for the, uh, the wholeness of all of humanity, and they led the work for equal marriage. Today, from the national offices of our denomination to our local congregations such as these two, the UCC is an international leader in the hard and political work of economic, environmental, and racial justice. In fact, rooted in the way of Jesus, doing justice, seeking peace, and building beloved, equitable, inclusive community are central to the identity of our denomination the United Church of Christ. So what's a preacher to do? How do we look at this hot seat issue and find our way through? Theologian Karl Barth is often quoted as teaching preachers to hold the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. But what Barth really said in Time Magazine in 1966 in the midst of the civil rights movement was this. Take your Bible, take your newspaper, read both, but interpret the newspaper from your Bible. For my nickel, that's a really helpful clarifier when it comes to politics and our contemporary conditions. We need to start in scripture, not the other way around. 
perhaps more importantly, as people of faith, we need to start with Jesus, with the way of Jesus, and interpret everything through that lens. The news, the church, politics, politicians, the economy, the environment, education, housing, food access, the arts, racial justice, and yes, even the dinner table. We interpret through the lens of Jesus, the way of love. So let's turn to the texts that we heard today. In this text from his letter to Titus, Paul is understood to have encouraged believers not to withdraw from the world, but to conduct themselves as good citizens, to still be involved in government as a way to bring God's kingdom into our communities. Now, I need to admit that the idea of being obedient to authorized authority sets my teeth to grinding. I don't know about you, but in Paul's pastoral view, this obedience is integral to the life of faith. And the idea translates to following or being respectful of the order that God has established in the political world, in the family, and in the church as the household of God. In other words, we have a duty to be engaged voluntarily in government. And as good citizens, we must also be ready to do whatever is good. We must be prepared and willing to participate in activities that promote the welfare of the community. According to Paul, we must not stand coldly aloof from the praiseworthy enterprises of government, but show good public spirit, thus proving that Christianity is a constructive force in society. Now, I may be preaching to the choir here. I mean, we are pretty progressive UCC congregations. And yet, I can imagine that there are times when you might wish we could just take a break from all this politics and social justice talk. So let me just make a space for that plea for just a moment. As your pastor, I want to give you space to say in your heart, oh my gosh, could we just take a break from this? It is hard, hard work to keep being Jesus' hands and feet in the world. And so I can imagine that you might wish we could take a break and talk about something simpler like, what's for dinner, or how about singing a psalm? Praise the Lord, the psalmist wrote. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. Ha, but even there, in the hymns of the church, our faith turns to revolution. The psalmist sets up in the next few verses realistic expectations for the revolution. While it's important to participate in the political system, we can't let it become an idol in our life. Every ruler and leader will ultimately fail us, the psalmist says. There's no politician more powerful than God. Earthly authority figures will come and go, but the God of love and justice, she sings, is always enthroned and always there to be our guide. And then notice how the psalmist begins to sing this description of God's heart in verses 7 through 9. This is a God of justice indeed, and as God's hands and feet in the world, we need to do all we can to promote God's heart for justice too. What was that thing Jesus said, Tom, about what you do for the least of these, you do for me? The psalmist lays out the plan here. And in our contemporary world, were you to want to implement things like this more widely than perhaps with your next door neighbor, which you certainly should do, it would require some political will. Imagine that we could promote God's heart by protecting the, uh, the oppressed by feeding the hungry, by bringing righteousness to the justice system, by bringing both physical and spiritual healing to others, by exalting those with character, not just those with wealth or power, by providing help to those outside of our country, by providing financial help to widows and orphans, and by halting wickedness. 
In other words, economic, environmental, and racial justice, equity in marriage and civil rights in our justice system, access for all to food, housing, health care, education, the arts, reforms in immigration, taxation, and policy, policing policy. It all sounds like the stuff of politics to me. I don't know about you. And it sounds impossible on the surface. But the psalmist then reminds us that God has always, does now, and will forever reign. And if we look to government institutions to bring complete peace and wholeness to the world, we will be disappointed and tossed to and fro with every news cycle. But if we show up and do our part, well, if we stay in the conversation and find ways to develop the skills for civil dialogue and discovery, if we vote the Lord's values, let me say that again, vote the values that we know are the way of Jesus, the way of love, if we ensure with our vote that all Americans maintain their right to vote, and oh, by the way, that's a whole nother sermon about how our constitution is built on white supremacy and designed only to give rights to white male property owners. I told Tom this morning, I wish we were having a four week series on politics. And if we place our confidence in the unchanging God of creation and the love of God in Christ Jesus, we will be able to stand firm for justice regardless of who is in the White House or the State House or Medford City Hall. Years ago, in the midst of a debate about the death penalty, talk about a hot button topic, Christian ethicist John Howard Yoda, uh, Yoder, <laughs> Yoda, Yoder, known for his pacifism and scholarship, wrote that non Christians will insist that we should keep our religion out of the way of their politics. But the reason for that, he said, is not that Jesus has nothing to do with the public realm. It is that they want nothing to do with Jesus. Yoder literally wrote the books on this subject. There were several. While some tradition has painted a portrait of Jesus as a savior aloof from governmental concerns and whose teachings point to an apolitical life for his disciples, such a picture of Jesus is far from accurate, according to the author of The Politics of Jesus. In his scholarship, Yoder surveys the multiple ways that the image of an apolitical Jesus has been propagated then canvasses the gospel narrative to reveal how Jesus is rightly portrayed as a thinker and a leader immediately concerned with the agenda of politics and the related issues of power, status, and right relations. Passages from the epistles then corroborate a savior deeply concerned with social, political, and moral issues the very same heart of God issues of which our psalmist sings. Yoder wrote that Jesus was not just a moralist whose teachings had some political implications. He was not primarily a teacher of spirituality whose public ministry unfortunately was seen in a political light. He was not just a sacrificial lamb preparing for his immolation or a God-man whose divine status calls us to disregard his humanity. Jesus was in his divinely mandated, in other words, promised, anointed, and messianic prophethood, priesthood, and kingship, the bearer of a new possibility of human, social, and therefore political relationships. That sounds like politics to me. Both the press and the church claim as a purpose, remember Bible in one hand, newspaper in the other. Didn't do a great job with that transition. Both the press and the church claim as a purpose to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. How else might that happen than through a politics worthy of the human heart and guided by the way of Jesus. Beloved, never forget 
that we are the ones we have been waiting for. May it be so.